Okay, so we're there in Hebrews chapter number 13, and the verse that I want us to begin with tonight is verse number 6. Look at verse number 6, we've just read there. It says, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We can boldly say that the Lord is my helper. We don't have to fear what man can do unto us. Why? Why? Look back at the previous verse, verse number 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, talking about God, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So we can be bold, we can be confident, we can be without fear, because God is with us. And the title of the sermon tonight is, Facing and Overcoming Your Fears. Facing and Overcoming Your Fears. Because if there's one thing that's going to hold you back in life, no matter what you do, no matter what, whether you're a child or an adult, whether you're a man or a woman, whatever you do by way of occupation, whatever you do in, in serving God, there is nothing that will hold you back from serving God more than fear. There's nothing that will hold you back from doing what you should be doing than fear. Okay, so um, yeah, the title of the sermon this evening is Facing and Overcoming Your Fears. Now, if you were here this morning... You might remember that we're in Proverbs chapter 23. Remember in Proverbs chapter 23, in verse number 17, it said, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. We went and we, we looked in Deuteronomy, we saw a bunch of verses that were showing us that basically fear in God is related to keeping his commandments. Um, we also turned and looked at Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Actually, you have a look at that quickly now. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. So just after the book of Proverbs, you've got Psalms. Proverbs, and then you've got Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You see, throughout the whole Bible, there is a big emphasis on fearing God. You'll find that the expression fear God occurs, I think it's about 10 times. You'll find those two words, fear God, fear God. You'll also find fear the Lord, I think it's 30 times. Fear the Lord, fear the Lord. You'll find another 30 times it talks about fear of the Lord. So it's just kind of different ways you know, to say fear God, fear the Lord. Well, guess what? Those are still the same. And the fear of the Lord, that's, that's the fear of God. Okay. Now you might ask, what exactly does it mean to fear the Lord? You're there in, in Ecclesiastes, just before there is Proverbs. Look back at Proverbs chapter number 8. Proverbs chapter number 8. Proverbs chapter number 8. I'm hopefully not going to be going too long tonight, but... Um, We'll see how we get on. Proverbs chapter number 8 and verse number 13. Proverbs chapter number 8 and verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. So it's interesting. It says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Then it goes on and says pride and arrogancy, the evil way, the froward mouth do I hate. This is, this is basically um, wisdom is speaking here. And obviously wisdom is, a, is an attribute of God. Okay, And so when it's saying that wisdom hates pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth I hate, that's something that God hates. Okay, And so the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. To hate evil. In other words, if we want to fear God, we'll be like God. We'll, you know, we'll hate what God hates and we'll love what God loves. Okay, So the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Turn if you were to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Psalm 33 and verse number 8. Psalm 33 and verse number 8. Psalm 33 and verse number 8. Psalm 33, 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. So notice, and when it says, Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, that's saying the same thing twice. When it says let all the earth, that's talking about the people on the earth. So that's why it says let all the earth, and then the second part of the verse says let all the inhabitants of the world. So all the earth and all the inhabitants of the world, that's the same thing. It's basically saying everyone. Let everyone do what? Fear the Lord. And then the second thing, it says stand in awe of him. So part of fearing the Lord is standing in awe of him. It's like you think you stand, it's like an amazement. You know, you're, you're standing wondering in amazement. It's when you're standing in awe. I mean, you might think of it being something like... Um, um, I don't know, have you, ever, have, you ever, have you ever looked at like an amazing sunset, you know, or a sunrise and you've seen that like, you know, and you just look at it and just think, wow, that's amazing. It's just, you think that's incredible, don't you? It's an amazing thing, an awe-inspiring an awe thing. But of course, 
What you're doing when you're doing that, you're looking at something that God made. Well, how much more amazing than that is the person who made it? Obviously, God is much more amazing than anything that he made. So if you marvel at his creation, we should marvel even more at the creator himself. Because we realize that he's the one who did it. You know, you might have seen some of those pictures they have of um, like faraway galaxies and stuff, and they see all the different colors and the different amazing things. But of course, think, who was the one that put that in place? You know, the Bible says, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou didst ordain. It says, what is man that thou mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. So it says, look, when I consider these things, it's amazing that you actually think about us. That you think about us, God. And that's, that's an incredible thing. And so we should be amazed by God. We should be in awe of him. We should fear him. But also, it should be because what can God do? If God's powerful enough to do that, what can he do? And so there's an element in which we should have not just a respect and awe, but also a fear of God. A fear of God. I mean, the Bible talks about people fearing with trembling. Fearing with trembling. Um, turn, if you were to Psalm 34, just over the page. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse number 11. Psalm 34, verse 11. We're talking about the fear of God. Psalm 34, verse 11 says, Come ye children, hearken unto me. That means listen unto me. Let's see the first part of the word, H-E-A-R, that's hear, so hearken. Hear me, hearken unto me. Come ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. See, so I'm going to teach you the fear of the Lord. If you, if you, if, the thing is, if you fear God, if you desire life, many days, seeing good, then don't do what's wrong. Keep your tongue. Keep your tongue from speaking, um, depart from evil. Keep your tongue from, from evil, your lips from speaking guile. Why? Because the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. God sees, and God sees everything. But he sees you when you're being righteous, when you're doing what's right. He sees that. And he's, he's paying attention to that. But of course, he's also, you know, sees when we're doing what's wrong. And you don't want God to be against you. Okay, so it's important that we understand, understand the fear of the Lord. You see, this is not, these are just some Old Testament verses. But Jesus also, he told us to fear God. Look at Luke chapter number 12. Luke chapter number 12 in the New Testament. Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 4. Luke chapter number 12, Luke chapter 12, and verse number 4. Luke chapter 12 and verse number 4. It says, And I say unto you, my friends, this is Jesus speaking, Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. So what does Jesus say? Don't be afraid of people who can kill you. So think of you know, some ferocious person with a big gun or a machete or something. Jesus says, look, don't fear people who can kill the body. He says, Don't be not be, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. Once they've killed you, that's all they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. So saying, look, don't fear people, fear God. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. So notice he says, don't fear men, but fear God. And then he says, don't fear again. Okay? So just so we notice, he says here, look, fear him that hath power to cast into hell. Now, is God going to cast the believer into hell? Obviously not. He's not going to. But of course, Christians should live their lives with an awareness of hell. We should live our lives realizing that hell is real. Because a lot of Christians go through their life and they just... Hell is just the furthest thing from their mind. You see, if we were thinking about hell, we might live a little bit different. Not because we're scared of going there, but because we realize it's real. Because we realize that people are actually going there. Okay, keep your finger on Luke, but turn to Mark chapter number 9. Mark chapter number 9. Mark chapter number 9 and uh, verse number 43. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 43. <coughs> Mark chapter 9 verse 43. Mark chapter 9 verse 43. It says, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. 
It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Did you think the fire is ever quenched in hell? No, it says three times. The worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Well, if you've got a King James, it says that. If you've got the new ones, two of those, two of those three verses weren't actually there, okay? But we need to understand, hell is a real place where real people go. Turn if you were to Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 15. Revelation chapter 20, Revelation 20 and verse number 15 says, And whosoever, Revelation 20, 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Look down at Revelation 21, 8. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I mean, doesn't that sound like everybody? All liars. But of course, if you look back at verse number 7, it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So notice, the person who overcomes, I will be his God, he shall be my son, but the fearful. So the person who overcomes is distinct from the people in this list. Okay? And you say, well, who's, over, who's, the, uh, who's, who's this person who overcomes? Well, it tells us in um, 1 John chapter number 5, 1 John chapter number 5, um, 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 4, says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? Who's this person who overcomes? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So that's who the person who overcomes is, is the person who believes. Okay, but the thing we need to understand about hell, you see, hell. Who's ever heard someone say hell? The, what's the worst thing about hell? Oh, it's separation from God. I always ask people that when when I'm giving them the gospel. I say, yeah, what do you think the worst thing about hell is? And many people say, oh, it's being separated from God. And as soon as someone tells me that, tells me that they've been listening to someone as opposed to reading their Bible. Because the Bible actually says, if you look in Revelation chapter number, um, Revelation chapter number fourteen. Revelation chapter number 14 and verse number 9. Revelation chapter 14 verse number 9. You see, hell is not separation from God. It is not separation from God. I mean, we, we know Psalm 139, a very famous psalm, says, you know, whither shall I flee from thy um, spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? It says, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. God's in heaven, God's in hell. You can't get away from God. Wherever you go, he's there. But look at Revelation 14, verse number 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark and his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Where do you think that is? Being tormented with fire and brimstone. This is hell. But notice what it says. In the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. He is God himself. It's in his presence. And in case we wondered how long it went for, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. People think, oh, you just go to sleep, or it's just annihilation when it's finished all over. No, it's forever and ever. That's what the Bible teaches Okay, look back at Luke chapter 12. I did say keep your finger there, and then I didn't mind. Luke chapter number 12. <coughs> Luke chapter number 12. And uh, look in verse number... Oh, we pointed out before, yeah. In verse number 4, it said, remember it said, don't be afraid? Notice that, Luke chapter 12, and verse number 4. He said, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And then verse number 7, it says, fear not therefore. You have more value than many sparrows. So don't be afraid, don't be afraid. But in verse 5, it says, we should fear. So as believers, we don't have to fear hell, but the Bible says, so why should we fear God then? If we're not scared of going to hell, why should we fear God? Well, the Bible says that God chastens his children in this life. Okay, the word chasten, that means spank. God spanks his children. Turn if you to Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. God spanks his children. Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 5. Hebrews 12, 5 says... And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, 
and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So when it says chasteneth and scourgeth, it's saying who God gives a whipping to. Who he spanks. That's what it's saying. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? He's saying, look, what son is there whose father doesn't spank them? Now, a few years ago, you could have probably said that. But nowadays, you probably say, well, there's a lot of, a lot, there's a lot of sons whose fathers don't spank them. Okay, because we've gone away from what the Bible says. And it's working really well, isn't it? I mean, aren't children so much better behaved today? Don't we live in a much more, you know, a society that's free of violence? Because, you know, people just aren't spanking the children anymore and they're just, they're just so well behaved. Isn't that right? No, it's not, is it? Okay, in spite of what Helen Clark thinks. It's, it's foolishness. It's complete foolishness. I mean, why would I, why would I want to get my parenting advice from somebody who doesn't have children? I mean, does that make any sense? It doesn't, does it? It makes absolutely no sense at all. But for some reason, these, these women that, are, you know, but anyway, let's not go off on that. Um, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Verse number eight. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. He says, look, he's saying, if you don't get spanked by your children, if you don't get, sorry, if you don't get spanked by God, then are you really his son? It says, furthermore, verse 9, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So because God loves us, he spanks us, just like a loving parent does. Okay, and, and this is not just this is not the only place in the Bible that talks about this. I mean, it says, for example, in First Corinthians chapter number eleven, so First Corinthians eleven thirty two says, "But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world." So God spanks us, but we're not going to be condemned with the world. We're not going to go to hell, but He will spank us. Proverbs chapter three verse eleven says, "My son, despise not thou the chase, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of His correction. For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth." Even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. So the reason God spanks his children is because he loves them. Okay? In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteth him betimes. Okay? The, the loving parent will spank their children, and they'll spank them early. Okay? Because I understand, I mean, children should learn. So that when they're young, they get spanked. And as they get older, they shouldn't need to get spanked. Why? Because they've been taught. They've learnt what to do and what not to do. That's, that's the general idea. But you see, when you don't teach them, when you don't spank them, they grow up and they're still just like a, a, a little kid. And the Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction should drive it far from them. They grow up and they're like, they've got an adult's body, but they're still a child at heart. Which means they're just rebellious and they just do whatever they want. They just do whatever they feel like. Because isn't that what children do? Isn't it? That's what they do, isn't it? They just do whatever they feel like. They're ruled by their emotions. I mean, you think, of, think about a really young child. Don't they just want to throw a, a temper tantrum? When they get angry, what do they do? Scream and shout and carry on? That's what they want to do, isn't it? But as they get older, they get more self-control. Or well, they should. But you know, there are adults that do the same thing. They carry on like a child. <coughs> Okay, look at um, verse number 10 we're up to. Verse number 10, Hebrews 12, verse 10. It says, For they verily, talking about the, the earthly fathers, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, talking about God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So he's saying, look, God's doing it for our benefit. It's for our benefit that he corrects us. Now, no chastening, no spanking for the present seemeth to be joyous. Who's ever had a spanking thought, that's great? I loved it. Has anyone ever thought that? You didn't think it? No. It's for the press. It's not joyous, but grievous. It's not something you enjoy. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Okay? It's training you to do what's right. So it, it's unpleasant at the time, but afterwards, it, re it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And it does. Peaceable. And in other words, you know, your children will give you peace. But if you don't, you won't have peace. Okay? Um, but notice also, it's a process that takes time. It's a process that takes time. And this is not something that happens instantly. You see, God corrects us so that we will bring forth the fruit of righteousness. But it says um, in Galatians chapter number Galatians chapter number six. Um, Galatians chapter six, verse number seven. Galatians chapter six and verse number seven. It says, Be not deceived, <coughs> God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. So notice, we're talking about reaping the, the, you know, the, the fruit of righteousness. That's something, but it's down the track. It's not instantly. It's here, but don't be weary in well-doing, because in due season we'll reap. Okay? Because when you reap, when you sow something, you don't reap it straight away. You don't. But down the track, you do. And the thing is, actually, you reap more than you sowed. You reap more than you sowed. Um, remember we read in, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, that's what it said. It says, afterward it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of, of, of righteousness. Okay, um, actually, let's go back in, back in Hebrews 12 again. I just want to show you one more, one more verse. Verse number 28. Verse number 28. Um, describes the fear. Once again, we're talking about the, the, the fear that we should have. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's what we should have. We should have that fear. So, just to be clear, when it comes to facing and overcoming your fears, there is a type of fear that we should all have, and that is the fear of the Lord. Okay, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. But, although there's a, t there's a type of fear that we should have, fear of God, there's a type of fear that we shouldn't have. A type of fear that we shouldn't have. Turn, if you were to Proverbs chapter number 29. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 25. Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 25. Proverbs 29 and verse number 25. Proverbs 29 and 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So it's saying the fear of man. If you fear people, that brings a snare. What's a snare? It's like a trap. It's something that's going to trap you. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Um, Proverbs, oh yeah, there in Proverbs 29, look at Proverbs 28, verse number 1. This is a great verse. Proverbs 28, verse number 1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth. So does that sound like they're bold or they're fearful? They're fearful, they're running away. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Notice that. They're not afraid. Right, when you're righteous, it says they're as bold as a lion. You see, over 60 times in the Bible, we'll read these words, Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. 26 times we read, be not afraid. Be not afraid. God doesn't want you to be afraid. You see, if you're afraid, if you are overcome with fear, understand that didn't come from God. It didn't come from God. Look, if you were at 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 7. 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 7. 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. This is what God's given us. The spirit of power, love and a sound mind. Not the spirit of fear. Not the spirit of fear. Okay? So where does fear come from? Where does fear come from? Well, turn back a good way to find out. Um, if you want to study a subject in the Bible, a good idea is to go to the very first place it's mentioned and follow it all the way through. So find the first place it's mentioned, but then follow every other mention afterwards. We're not going to do all of that because there's so many hundreds of times it's mentioned. But let's have a look at the first place, uh, first mention of fear in the Bible is Genesis chapter number 3. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 6. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6. It says, And when the woman saw, this is talking about you've got Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Verse number 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves, among, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. That's the first time, the first mention of fear in the Bible. He says, look, I was afraid. Why was he afraid? He was afraid because he'd sinned. God was coming. He's like, he knew he'd done something wrong. And you see, fear is a result of sin. You see, fear causes us to hide from God. Now, 
Not literally like Adam, you know, not God's walking through the garden, you're hiding behind the bushes. But the fact is, we will hide from God. How will we hide from God? How about this? This is God's book. This is where God speaks to us. If I want to hide from God, I'll keep it shut. That's one way of hiding, you know. I won't come to church. If I come to church, God, you know, someone's going to, it's not that God's personally speaking, but in fact, as we read this word, he is. Okay, so what's, what are people going to do? People are going to, I don't want to come to church because I don't want God to, you know, I've been doing things I shouldn't be doing, so I don't want to hear from him. I don't want to, don't want to read the word. I'm praying. Am I going to pray to God when I'm busy doing what he says not to do? Okay? So we see that fear comes because of sin. It causes us to hide from God. And in that sense, fear is actually very much like sin. In fact, most fear actually is sin. Most fear actually is sin. Turn, if you were to Romans chapter number 14. Turn to Romans chapter number 14. Romans chapter number 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter number 14. Romans chapter number 14. Verse number 23. Romans 14 verse 23 says, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, and we sort of just go through it quickly, but in this chapter, in chapter 14, Paul explains that Christians are free to eat meat or not to. They can, it talks about you know, someone who's weak eats herbs, but someone thinks they can eat all things. Okay. Um, he also says that they're free to keep a special day or to treat every day alike. Do you want to say, well, I'm going to keep this day as my Sabbath. Okay? And someone else wants to treat every day the same. The Bible says it's fine. You can do either or either. But... Going against your convictions is wrong. You see, if you think something is a sin, then it is actually a sin for you to do it. Did you know that? Like, for example, um, and the Bible works really clear. In fact, in this chapter, it says you can eat whatever you want. Um, it says in First Timothy chapter 4, it talks about um, those that you know, forbid to eat certain meats. But then it says every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if we receive a thanksgiving. So it's absolutely fine if you'd have your bacon and eggs for breakfast. That's fine. But if you thought it was a sin, and then you went and had bacon and eggs, that would be a sin. Why? Because you think it's wrong, and if you do it anyway. Now, it's not wrong in and of itself, but you actually, it's like you're sinning against your own conscience, if you like, okay? But of course, more important than that, transgressing God's law. That's the real thing that's a sin, okay? So whether we, now, when it comes to God's law, whether we think it's a sin or not, it's still a sin. Okay? 1 John 3 verse 4 says, um, uh, what does it say? Uh, we should be called the sons of God, therefore, uh, but now we're the sons of God. I'm, I'm, I'm in the verses before. It says, sin is the transgression of the law. So I, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's normally there. I've got the whole chapter, the whole book memorized, but sometimes it just disappears. Um, 1 John chapter number 3 verse number 4 says, look, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. If you commit sin, that's transgressing the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. It's when God says, do this, and you don't do it. Or if God says, don't do that, and you do it. That's what a sin is. That's what sin is. Okay? Um, turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 31. Deuteronomy chapter number 31. Deuteronomy chapter number 31 and verse number 6. Deuteronomy chapter number 31 and verse number 6. Deuteronomy 31 verse number 6. It says... Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people into the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. The Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, Fear not, neither be dismayed. So look, didn't God command, don't fear, don't fear, don't be afraid? Well, if sin is transgression of the law, and if God says, don't be afraid, if you're being afraid, you're transgressing God's law, you're transgressing what he said to do. Um, Mark chapter 4, verse 40, you don't need to turn there, but Jesus, and he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? Maybe you should turn there, because this is worth underlining. Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? So the Bible makes a note of pointing out, Jesus points out, look, being fearful shows a lack of faith. Mm. Notice that? Fearful 
and lacking in faith. There's the contrast here. You see, we know that faith, trust in God, is a good thing. Now, fear is actually not trusting God. That's, that's a bad thing. When we're fearing, we're not trusting God. You see, God doesn't want us to be afraid. Turn if you were to the book of Psalms, you'll see a few quick verses that show us God doesn't want us to be afraid. We'll just only look at some of them. Um, Psalm 6. So, excuse me, Psalm 3, verse 6. Psalm number 3 and verse number 6. Psalm number 3. Psalm number 3, verse number 6 says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Not afraid of ten thousands of people. We're probably all familiar with Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verse number 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalm 27, Psalm 27, verse number 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Verse number 3, Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Psalm 46, verse number 2. Psalm 46, Psalm 46, and verse number 2 says, Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Psalm 56, verse number 3. Psalm 56, and verse number 3. Psalm 56, verse 3 says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Notice that. Being afraid, trusting in God is the solution. Verse number 4 says, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Verse number 11. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. That sounds like what Jesus was talking about. Psalm 112. Psalm 112 and verse number 7. Psalm 112, verse number 7. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Notice that. Over and over you're seeing being afraid versus trusting in the Lord. Psalm 118, verse number 6. <coughs> Psalm 118, verse number 6. says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? So over and over again we see God. He doesn't want us to fear. Jesus says many times, fear not. Don't you turn there, but Luke 8, 50 says, But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. We sang early on tonight, didn't we sing Isaiah 41, 10? Remember, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will comfort thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The title of the sermon tonight is Facing and Overcoming Your Fears. We've seen that we should fear God. We've seen that we shouldn't fear man. So how do we overcome our fears? Let's just look at one major place now. Um, 1 Samuel chapter number 17. 1 Samuel chapter number 17. There's a very famous passage in the Bible, a very famous account of um, bravery, I suppose you'd say, in the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17 is the account of David and Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Look at verse number 1. <coughs> It says, now the Philistines were gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at, at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekar and Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley, valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So notice, <coughs> this giant, he's probably ten foot tall. He's dressed up, he's got all this armour and all this sort of stuff. And he's saying, look, come on down, come on down and fight. Verse 11, And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So they're terrified. 
they're terrified. There's this great big, this huge giant. And he's saying, come and fight. And none of them want to fight. Even Saul, even though Saul's bigger than, he's a head taller than all the other Israelites, he's not putting his hand up to say, I'll go down and fight. Even though the king is supposed to be fighting the battles. But they're afraid. Now, <coughs> David, the, who's, who's the youngest brother, his, his, David, remember King David, David the shepherd boy, ends up becoming the king. Um, remember he's got older brothers. He's got older brothers. His older brothers, or some of his older brothers, are down here. There's some of these Israelites that are down there to fight. So they're the ones that are, that are terrified. And so David, he comes down to deliver some food to his brothers. And look at the, look at the reaction. Have a look at verse number, verse number 23. And as he talked with them, this is David, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, <coughs> out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel as he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. So you say, look, the person who kills this guy is going to get great riches from the king. He's going to be able to marry the king's daughter. And in fact, his house, his family, they're going to be tax free. Wouldn't that be a good thing? You say, this is what's going to happen. This great reward that's being offered. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What should be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? He says, what? So what did you say? What's going to happen? He's going to get a reward. And he's going to marry the king's daughter. And he's going to be, his family's going to be tattooed. David, I mean, because he was there. And they've already told him. And David said, Now what did you say? He says, you know, What shall be done? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that he should defy the armies of the living God. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. So they tell him again. So <clears throat> the interesting thing when it comes to overcoming your fears, the first thing we notice about David is he's concerned about, well, what's the reward? What's going to happen? That's what he's looking at. He's fo focusing on the end result. He's not focused on, the, on this big scary giant. He's saying, what's going to happen? If I do this, if I kill him, what, what's going to happen? That's what he's doing. He's fo focusing on the reward. Okay? But not only that, he also recognised that, that, that they were on God's side. He says, look, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He recognised, look, we're on God's side. So do we really have to be afraid of this big, big giant here? Look at, verse number, look at verse number 32. Verse number 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail him, fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So David puts his hand up. He says, look, I'll go. I'll go. You know, it reminds me of um, Isaiah chapter number 6. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I. Send me. Say, look, I'll go. I'll do it. Look at verse number... Verse number... Well, verse 33. Saul says, and Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. So Paul saw Saul saying, You can't do this. You can't fight him. He's too big. He's too strong for you. But what does David say? And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his bed and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Once again, notice he's saying, because he knows whose side he's on, that God's on his side. But also he's saying, look, <laughs> he says, I've, I've fought battles previously. I've done this previously. And you see, when you've, when you've done things previously, that does give you confidence for what's going to happen in the future. You know? It's like you, it's like you build upon what you've done previously. Um, but of course, you still have to actually, there still has to be a first time. I mean, there must have been a time before David had ever fought a lion, before he'd ever fought a bear, before he'd ever fought, I don't know, some little dingo or something that might have come. There had to be a, there had to be a first time. We had to decide, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm, I remember back, I think it was, it was like about seven and a half years ago, the first time I went soul winning. And I remember the first time I went soul winning. And if you could describe my attitude before I went soul winning, do you think I was really bold? Do you think I was filled with courage? I was like David. I was as bold as a lion. Do you think, who thinks I was like that? Who thinks I was scared? Who thinks my, my I was probably more like um, Belteshazzar. Is it Belteshazzar or Belshazzar, whichever one is. His knees smoked one against... I think that was... I was like that. My knees were knocking. I was terrified the first time I went soul winning. 
But the thing about it was, I just I knew this is what God wanted me to do. He said, go and preach the gospel. And so I just, I knew I had to do it. Now, I didn't just go blindly. I prepared. I prepared. So I wrote out what I was going to say. I decided this is what I'm going to say. I wrote it out. I practiced it. I practiced it in front of a mirror. I practiced it with myself. I practiced it with my family. But then you can only practice so much. And it's like, you know, there's only one, one thing to do. You've actually got to go out and do it. And so I went out and knocked that first door. And you know, the first door I knocked, I was terrified. But then the next door I knocked, it wasn't as bad. Because the first door I knocked, no one killed me. It didn't, you know, it wasn't a fatal thing. I mean, the guy was actually really, God was very kind. The guy invited me in and sat me in and gave me a cup of tea. Very first door. And how, how rare is that for, for that to happen? That's pretty rare that that happens, and yet that happened on the very first door. So God was, God was very gracious there, okay? But you see, often the biggest fear that people have in life is the fear of failure. Isn't that what it is? It's the fear of failure. You think, what if I do this and if it doesn't work? What if I go and knock on someone's door, try to preach them the gospel, and it doesn't work? That's, they're scared of failing, aren't they? They're scared of failing. But the thing about it is, well, what happens if you don't go and preach someone the gospel? I mean, what, what do you, the, the, object, the object of preaching someone the gospel is so that they'll be saved. You want them to believe so they'll be saved and they'll go to heaven and not go to hell. That is the objective. Well, if you don't go and preach to them, are they going to get saved? No. So by not doing it, you're automatically going to fail. And that's like that with anything. I mean, you know, I was taking the boys for some, um, I did some driving lessons and stuff the other night, you know, and when you're doing, when you're doing driving lessons, when it's something that's new, you know, and no one likes it when, you know, when it's just new and you're not very good at something, because who, who wants to do something they're not good at? You know, it doesn't feel good, does it? But the fact is, if you don't do that, then you'll always be no good at it. You know, if you never learn to drive, then you'll never be able to drive. And it's just like, I mean, everyone's gone through it. It's just like when you learn to ride a bike. At the start, who jumped on a bike and the first time they just biked up and was just, no, what happened? You fell off. And you fell off. And you fell off. But eventually you get the hang of it and you get better and better. And now you ride a bike and you don't even think about it. You just jump on and away you go. Same thing with driving a car. It's the same thing. Well, it's the, same, it's the same with preaching the gospel. You learn to preach the gospel and you get better at it. And you learn and you get better at it. Okay? Um, and so, but when you don't try, it's certain that you're going to fail. It's absolutely certain. So if you want to face your, you know, face your fears, look them head on and say, look, what is there really to be afraid of? What is there really? There's nothing. You know? Let's look back at David again. Look what he was saying here in verse number, verse number 45. Verse number 45. I love David's attitude. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. So he was saying, look, you're coming with these weapons, but I'm coming in the name of God, the creator of everything. Remember the God who should fill us with awe and fear. That's who David was coming with. You know, it says in 1 John 4, 4, it says, Year of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So what is there to be afraid of? There's nothing. If Philippians, have a look at Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 13. Philippians 4, 13. says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notice that. I can do all things. We sang earlier on, Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, for whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. You're going to say, where's my help going to come from? Look up to the hills, who's going to help me? God will help me. You know God, the one who made heaven and earth, doesn't that kind of give you confidence to say you've got someone? I, mean, I remember when I, I, I went to school, I didn't get home school when I was a kid. Um, I went to just normal public school. But I was, I don't know, because I was quite short you might find it hard to believe but I was quite short when I was a kid and, um, and I went to school and I, and I was quite mouthy as well I was quite short and mouthy it's probably not a good combination for someone going to beat you up but I sort of seemed to live a bit of a charmed life everyone sort of you know there was never any problem but of course probably one of the reasons was because I had a brother who was three years older than me and another one who's four years older than me so for the schools the schools that I was at I had these older brothers and so it's probably just and I, I was just 
I didn't really sort of know, but it's probably just, not that my brothers were big and tough or anything, but they were bigger than the people that I was mouthing off to, you know? And so it's, it's that whole thing, it's you've got, because you've got someone who's looking after you. Well, guess what? God is better than a big brother. He's better than a big brother. He's someone that's going to look after you, okay? Um, let's wrap things up. We've seen <coughs> that we should fear God, but we shouldn't fear man. See, those two things, they're opposite. You can't fear God and fear man. If you fear man, then you're not fearing God. It's like, it's like you know, Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't be serving God, loving God, and at the same time serving mammon. You know, loving mammon, loving money. You can, it's, it's one or the other. You can't have, he said, no man can serve two masters. Because if one says to do this and one says to do that, which one are you going to do? Well, it's the same thing. Are you going to fear God? Are you going to fear man? Because when you fear man... Man is going to want you to do things that God doesn't want you to do. And God's going to want you to do things that man doesn't want you to do. You know what I'm saying? In other words, think about peer pressure. Think about like a young person. They're out with their friends and they get offered alcohol. What do they want to do? What am I going to do? Will I drink this? What will they think of me if I say no? I don't want to. So it's a choice. If you fear man, then you'll do what those people around you... But is that then fear in God? Whereas in contrast, if you fear God, then you're not going to fear man. And you can go, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm with God. Okay? Um, we can overcome our fears because we know that God is with us and he will actually fight our battles. You say, God is with us? Is God really with us? Have a look at James chapter number 4. It's just a couple more scriptures we'll look at. James chapter number 4. James chapter number 4 and verse number 7. James chapter number 4 and verse number 7. James 4 and verse number 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. So it says, go near to God. God's going to go near to you. But then it says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. So drawing nigh to God, God drawing nigh to you, is right beside cleansing your hands, you sinners. Purifying your hearts, you double-minded. Okay? And so, are you going to draw nigh to God with dirty hands? Are you going to draw nigh to God with an impure heart? Now, it's true that we are still impure. It's true that the cleansing we need comes from Jesus Christ. But the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, we have that with being saved. But having said that also, just within our fellowship with him, if we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing, are we, we talked about before, are we going to draw, are we going to go to church, are we going to read our Bible, are we going to pray? No, because of what's going on in our lives. The Bible says, no, that's not what we should do. We, we need to put these things away from us so that we can draw an eye to God. And when we do that, hey, resist the, submit yourselves to God. Submit yourselves to God. It's like obeying God. Do what God says to do. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Um, last two places we'll look. Um, well, maybe last two. Maybe slightly more than that. Um, Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Let me look at Psalm 46. Psalm 46, verse number 1. Psalm 46, verse number 1. says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we saw this verse before, therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. <coughs> verse number five, God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. Notice that. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Knowing, look down at verse number 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen, I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. God is with us. I'm, one of Jesus' names is Emmanuel. That means God with us. Having God with you, you don't have to be afraid. That's what it said back in, back in Hebrews chapter number 13, where we started. Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5. And says, look, let your conversation be without covetousness. That's saying, look, don't be covetous. That's saying, get away from the sin of covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have, for he said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. 
You see, overcoming fear, we need to understand. We need to put these bad things out of our life. Get sin out of our life. If God's saying don't do this, then don't do it. If God says do this, then just decide I'm going to do it. You see, overcoming fear involves a decision. And that's something that, it's a decision that we have to make, and we have to make it repeatedly. Choose to fear God rather than men. You see, there's, there's a temptation, whatever your sphere of life is, you will be tempted to fear man rather than fear God. I mean, you see it all over the place. I mean, one place you see it really obvious, you see it behind the pulpit. You see it behind the pulpit. You see where <coughs> people choose, they're scared of the people in the congregation. And so, what are you going to do? You just get up and tell them nice things. You tell them things that they want to hear. But the Apostle Paul, he says, look, he said to the Galatians, he says, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He says, do I now persuade men or God? He says, if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So he said, look, you've got a choice. He had a choice. Was he going to serve God? Was he going to please God? Or was he going to please man? And the fact is that many things that this book says doesn't please man. That's just a fact. And when you say those things, people aren't going to like it. And so the pastor thinks, well, what am I going to do? You know? And a prime example I can think of is just, I was thinking about this recently, there's, a, there's an example of where people, one of the things that people will put ahead of God is they will put work ahead of God. They'll put it ahead of them. And we all have to work. I understand that. We have to work. But the fact is that because I've seen this many times in my life, I've seen where people put work ahead of God, and the, the example I'm specifically thinking of, I'm specifically thinking of women working. Now the Bible makes it really clear that women are not supposed to be working. That men, women are supposed to be raising the children at home. That's what they're supposed to be doing. Men are supposed to be working. But in today's world, it's really common for women to go out and work. Okay? And, and I, 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 this last church, the, the previous church I was at, I remember there was this lady who came over from the Philippines, and she, lovely lady, loved the Lord, she'd be at all the services. She was there at Bible study, midweek Bible study, she was there on Sunday morning, she was there on Sunday night, faithful, loved God. And she came over from the Philippines and she got married. And there was a certain time had to pass before she could get a working visa, I think. But once she got a working visa, then what happened? She got a job. Now she got a job, unlike many people, many people get jobs where they're actually working during church. Now, that's putting work before God. Okay? Now, it's not a sin to work on a Sunday. You know, we won't have the Sabbath or anything like that. But should we really be missing church and going to work instead? We shouldn't. We need, we need to put God first. And the thing is, if we trust God, he'll provide for us. He will provide for what we need. But anyway, so... One thing, you see, if people choose to work on the Sunday, or they choose to work when church, church is on. But then even beyond that, just a woman working in general, this lady started working, and she wasn't working during church time. But because she was working, at the end of the day, she didn't come to Bible, Bible study all the time, because she's tired, and she'd work the next day. You know, she'd be feeling a little bit sick, so on a Sunday, she'd only come to one service, or sometimes no services. Why? Because she's under the weather, and she had, had work on Monday. And so, what was more important? Was God more important, or was work more important? And, and I saw this lady where she, was, she, she loved God, she was passionate for things of God, and what happened to her? Her passion went down, her zeal went down, her church attendance went down, and you saw the results in her life. You know? And so, and the thing is, that's not a popular message. If you, if you mention that, if you mention women working in churches, most churches, that's very unpopular. It's a very unpopular... And so most pastors, they won't say anything. Now, I've got a choice. You see, I can choose to think, if I love God, I'm going to say what God says. Because I want what's best for you guys. In fact, if I love you guys, I'll say what's best for you guys. Even if you don't like it. Why? Because I've got your best interests at heart. It's just like... I mean, think about the example of we looked at before about like spanking a child. If you love your child, you'll chasten them. Well, you guys aren't my children, and I'm not going to spank you, but I will tell you what the Bible says. 
whether you like it or whether you don't like it, because it's for your good. It's for your own good, you know? And so, overcoming fear, you've just got to make a decision. It's as simple as that. Make a decision and just decide what is the right thing to do and don't let fear sway you. Don't think, oh, what if I did this? If I did this, this is what's going to happen. No, just say, what's the right thing? What does God want me to do? And just decide to do it. You can overcome fear. We need to face our fears. Admit that they're really there. Admit that they're really there and overcome those fears. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us to be a people that wouldn't be disabled by fear. Because that's what fear does. Fear disables us. Fear prevents us from serving you in so many different capacities. Lord, help us to be people who are righteous. Help us to be people who are as bold as a lion. Not to be swayed by fear, but to put you first, to put your word first, to put your will first, and to know that you promised you'll never leave, leave us nor forsake us, that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Why, why, why should we fear what man can do unto us? Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving your life that we might have life, regardless of how we live, regardless of how our performance measures up or doesn't measure up, because our performance doesn't measure up, period. The Bible says all our righteousness are as filthy rags. But Lord, please help us to work in a way that would please you and that would, and that would serve you. Help us to overcome our fears, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.